playtime in the afternoon in Suffolk, England, 1676. The game, a croquet as it was played then. Heavier mallets because they were lead-weighted, wider wickets and leather-covered balls. The thought you just heard was a pretty one, made by Guy Marcy. And now, a friend of his, John Nims, leans over to line up his shot. Beautiful shot. And now John's cousin, Roger, kneels down to sight his shot. Careful player. Lines it up and... Which was Guy Marcy, muscular man, hitting Roger over the head with a lead-weighted mallet. Killing him. Tonight, my report to you on Roger Nim. How he, though dead, won the game. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The Dutch were drowning the English off the coast of Suffolk. And the English were retaliating. The latest and greatest naval war of the 17th century was being fought. The war which gave to history Thomas Golding, who demanded only a flaming deck and clean cutlass. And above these battles, white cliffs above, was the castle of the Nems family. And the Nems cousins used to sit and watch the skies being lighted with the shock of sea battle. They watched because they believed this much superior to taking part. They were rich and had paid other men to fight the Dutch in their place. Roger and John, lads of 20, orphans both. And when there was no fighting to watch, they would have sport, play croquet. Pretty, cousin. Pretty, pretty. A rippy roly. <laughs> Truth and mark me twice. I've won again. So it'll be when you'll take Guy Marcy into a game and beat him. <laughs> I could die happy. Oh, speak not of dying. It's only jesting. Yet each thing you wish. You say if you could have it, you would die happy. I want to hear none of it, so let me speak of it. <laughs> cousin, cousin. Good cousin to worry of me. And why not? Responsibility that you are to me. Responsibility? Me to you? Fathom me how. How wealthy you are. This castle yours and all that's in it and the lands and the stock. No less yours. Only because you are kind to me. All the wealth is yours and in your name. But if I should die before you... It will be mine, this castle, and all that's in it, and the land... Cousin John. I know. The will you've made to me. Good cousin. Kind cousin. Cousin John. Yes, cousin Roger. I've changed it again. The will? Uh, The will. Changed it. How? Or should I have children, then all my estates and all my wealth to them? Or he or she? Oh. Only fair. For if I had children, then I would be a father. And as father, I owe a debt to my progeny. Cousin Roger? Yes, Cousin John. Is there anything on your mind, Cousin Roger? Last night, dear cousin, and you will be happy for me, I met a maid. Oh? A duck, a bunsen maid. Luli with pinky cheeks and throat of soft and white and hair of radiance. How I met you, this maid? I was walking her in the village green and spied this maid with courage that would make you blush. Tell me of it. She played at croquet on the public green. Oh. And she had a slyness to her wrist. And I spoke to her. And we played a game. And after went walking, oh. And uh, she told me her name was Mary. Mary of Southolt. And you've heard of the maids of Southolt, cousin. The marrying maids of Southolt. Yes. Another game, cousin. Very well. Losers first, I've heard it said. (laughs) You've heard it said indeed. So swing your mallet, cousin, and we'll have joyous game. Oh, too bad. say Cousin Roger won again. So they sacked Mallet and went inside. If Cousin Roger noticed that Cousin John hardly touched his loser's cup, he didn't say a word. Nor did he protest too much when John announced he was going out. A tottling I go, Cousin. I have not done it for so long. But speak my name in the tavern and that of Bonio. But a tottling Cousin John did not go. 
Instead, he went down to Southertown and inquired of a maid named Mary, she who did a sly thing with her wrist at croquet. And he found her at her home in a wisteria grove, foot to treadle and spinning. I did not want to interrupt your spinning, Mary, but your brother said it was all right to do, saying, as he did, that you're too much at the wheel. You say your name is... John Nem. Of Roger Nem? Kinsman. Mother to me now dead was to father of him, rest his soul, brother and sister of same parent done. Cousin, though. Without doubt. And living, too. Be seated, then, for this is a fortunate time. Fortunate? How? Well, as my foot was to treadle and round the wheel did go, spinning flax to thread, my thoughts were of your cousin. In what respect? How he charmed. Is that fondness, Mary? You to him? So much fondness. Poor Mary, poor lass. Oh, how? You had thoughts of marrying to him and having children of it? Yes, these thoughts came and... Why do you say poor Mary, poor lass? Because my cousin is mad. Mad? He thinks himself all manner of beasts, even to birds. What are you saying? The curse of my family, which came to his side from his father, and before him his father's aunt, who you might have heard. <gasps> Yet the truth. Therefore entertain no thoughts of loving my cousin. Oh, no, I, I shall not. Then goodbye, dear girl. Oh, but you need not go. <laughs> Day, Roger Mems, nor any other day. And that is why I will spend this afternoon and who knows how many others spinning my flat. But, Mary... So I say goodbye to you, Roger Mems. But you were so ardent and gave me hope. Hope? For what? That you would wed with me and come and live with me in my castle and soon small Mems about children to us. No, Roger. Poor Roger. Dear Roger. Go, Roger. Cousin John's strategy to dissuade any woman from wedding his cousin, therefore dissuading from becoming mothers, keep the money in the family, and the family was big enough as it was. But Cousin John didn't reckon with springtime. It was May, and the girl's name was Hannah, and Roger espied her walking oh down the beach, gathering cockle shells. For my garden, sir. And what is your name, pretty maid? Hannah. Hannah. Oh, to the name, that's for sure. And you're Roger Nems of the big and tall castle there. <laughs> and how are you knowing that? Have potted hedge and have spied you at the wicket. <laughs> <laughs> Barefooted gypsy Aye. I... gypsy With black eyes a flash and the trinkets in your ears and tawny hair. I must go now. Mm-hmm. Flirty. True, I must. And why? Because it's time you should ask me where I be night. And you have not asked me, so I should go. And where do you be nights, Hannah? Why are you asking? A man has a duty. What talk are you making? Uh, to settle down, to have him wife, to plant trees, to have children. Uh, you were asking where I be nights. There's a cottage in the uplands back and up the side of the rise where Grandmother Fabian keeps her lambs. Is where I am. <laughs> Is where I'll be. Pray, sir, what is befalling your cousin that you come in his stead? Not in his stead, young miss, but earlier. But why? My cousin Roger is in the garden under the moon, eating grass. Oh, what joke is No it? joke under lesser day, for he has madness in him. 
What? Yes. He had told me of you earlier, young miss. And surely he spoke well of your beauty and true of it. Of your eyes and throat and tawny hair. But of his sudden madness he told you nothing. No. No, he did not. But he told you he wished to marry and have children, eh? I? Well, this is in itself a madness, for he has a wife in Wales on those wild shores with six children. Oh! Now I must go. He's mad. As Sir Bromley. Oh! Good night, young man. So it went. Cousin Roger wanted nothing more than to get married and have children. Cousin John couldn't afford it. Each time Roger would meet a maid and make known his intentions, John would meet the same maid and declare that Roger was mad or already married or a secret criminal of unspeakable deed. It is even said that Roger Nems made his intentions known to none other than Dame May Bellamy, and she had considered him quite sincerely as she did all things. Until, of course, she had a little chat with Cousin John. Which, of course, may be the very reason Dame May locked herself up at Fallbrook never to feel sunshine again. Yet, Cousin Roger was not daunted. I feel it, Cousin. This month, I will find a girl to wed. How? Uh, a traveler on donkey back read my palm for a penny and said it. And for a week now, I've dreamed of a dear face I've never seen before. Yet, consider this, Cousin. So many of the damsels all about have refused you. Seventeen? Then give it up and be bachelor. A man should take a wife and plant a tree and have a child. I'd say give it up. Never. Which was wearisome talk to John. Once Roger got married, chances would shoot up that he would become a father. As a father, he would have an heir. And when Roger would have an heir... I'll be disinherited. Drink your ale and do not take on so, friend John. But hear me, Guy Marcy. The wealth he has, it could be mine. Aye, there's truth in that. And how rich he is, and each new girl wants to wipe him off. And I'm weary. Yet if he does not marry nor have children, you will inherit. If I outlive him. I have told you this, friend guy. A toast, then. Ah. A toast. But your cousin should drop himself down dead. This instant and now. Before he takes wife. Uh, before he becomes father. Before... Drop down dead? Maybe not this minute. Nor tonight. But whenever... And you'd have the wealth immediate. And good drinking companion and croquet companion you would share. I'd want to. And you would? We'll see. I cannot wait till tomorrow. Tuesday, a sunny day, and the dew was hardly off the grass before the cousins were lined up in front of the starting pole. Cousin John had brought his friend, Guy Marcy, muscular man, good croquet player. Whatever he aimed at with his lead-weighted mallet, he hit. listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Charles II was seated on the English throne in those days when the court still winced at the mention of the name Cromwell, a peculiarly small court, by the way, since the Great Plague, which was just now over, was no respecter of position. Two, 14 couriers, including the fabulous Lady Vickers, had perished together in the Great Fire. And, as I have mentioned, there was that war with the Dutch. The war was going badly, and the populace was muttering at the high taxes. This is the time, too, you'll remember, when Queen Catherine was accused, and, when not indicted, had set a style. England on her way up. 
And in the sunny meridians that encompass Suffolk, there was a game in progress. Well shot, Guy. <laughs> what they say of your man to Catler is the truth. Terry Earl, and now friend John, make your wicket. Would I could from this life. I'm for the middle wicket. Yes, you are, dear cousin. Hmm. And now... Oh, fumbly do. Oh, bad shot now. Now you're out of position, cousin. Oh, don't rub me with it. Take your shot, Roger. Oh, and how it rolls for the back wicket. Wicket do, wicket do. <laughs> it did. It's as skilled you are as any I've seen about. Sadio. Aye. My cousin is skilled in many things. Mm, the damsels, I'll wager a bucket. Uh, there'll be no more damsels. What are you saying, cousin? Uh, there's a surprise I have for you. What surprise? Uh, go on with the game and I'll tell you. Uh, the shot is Guy. Guy has had his shot. Now, what surprise? What are you saying of no more damsels? I met a one last night. A final one. And? Of the name Priscilla. And we love each other. So quickly. A love of poets. We marry on Broom Wednesday. Broom Wednesday is tomorrow, cousin. I know it. Tomorrow is bliss. It's the day when I come into family. And who knows how many there'll be come Michaelmas for Priscilla with one of triplets. My congratulations, then. Tis your shot, cousin? Aye. Fight your wicked well, Roger Nims. What is a difficult shot? Aye. Difficult shot, indeed. Cousin. Cousin Roger. Cousin now. Dead. Would you say, Guy? I'd say it. As I swung and how he was kneeling there, I knew it. Now we need dispose of him, Guy. The pond would seem a likely place. Aye, but yet... Yet what? I've heard eventually they float. Those who dead are placed in water come at last to the top and are discovered. Not those who dead are placed in water and are fastened to the bottom. Not those. I could not do it. I could. Will you? I'll must if no one to know what happened this day. So that you can live in the east wing of the estate with peace and ease of mind. I'll must if I want all that. muscular man and lungy and strong swimmer did this, according to a folio of the day I have here. They did strip him of his clothes, taking first from his hand the tightly clinching mallet, which he had been using for gaining. Thence they did carry him to a great and darkling pond in a lone field, and, taking him under the water at its deepest part, Guy Marcy did drive two stakes through him, thereby pinning him down, so that he would never become a floater. Then they did bury his clothes. And, thus doing, these wicked caitiffs, without torturing their souls on the rack of their consciences, Guy Marcy did go to the East Wing, which now he claimed as his. And John Nems proceeded immediately to make the castle, and all that was in it, his. Oh, so beautiful, this spinning wheel, as it turns. Mary. Mary. <laughs> I wanted to show it to you, Mary, to show you this spinning wheel. Here at Nem's Castle, since the day I called on you to tell you of Cousin Roger's lost darkness. <laughs> Cousin Roger has gone to America, you know. To do good there, I've heard. Yes. And now the castle is yours. Yes. Mary. Yes, John. Spin no more, but give me your hand. Yes. Now come to me. John? Yes, Dove. Who's to spin this wheel? You, Mary, as you come here each day, there's much flax and... I'll, I'll think of it. Yet come to me for a moment. Oh, so rich you are. Is that not so, John? Yes. Dear John, how rich... As rich as ever a fellow can be. How rich is that? Oh, I have a treasure chest and sparkling jewels and goldy things, a trove of treasure. <laughs> a secret trove at the bottom of a pot. Bottom of a... Where? I made a joke that there's no chest of treasure nor a trove. I scarce know when to believe you, John. Believe me now, there is no treasure nor trove. Believe me. <laughs> oh, dear John. I made a joke. I believe you. I believe you, John. Two can 
concerned about it to say was nothing, brother mine. Oh. A treasure trove, that's what. Now, you listen to me, Mary. All those hours spinning at the wheel spin your brain, too, I'm telling you. As I always said it would. A regular treasure chest with goldy things and, and sparkling jewels, he said. And, and he said it was... I like... know, I know, at the bottom of a pond. Now, what pond? I ask you that. But how many ponds are there near to the Means Castle? I ask you that. Scummy pond, and deep and black and cold it is. Treasure trove. And you want me to swim to the bottom of it and have a look. Tonight. Go back to your wheel. Will you do it? Yeah. Go back to your wheel. Brother dear, a swimmer, you're always saying you are, so... I be. Then swim. Cold water. The splashing about for warming you. Now go, fetch your sister a treasure trove. Yes, yes. Oh! To the bottom, to the bottom, brother. Oh, treasure trove and barley and goldy things. There's nothing. Oh, you haven't reached the bottom of it. Too soon you've come back. Cold. Be cold for your own dear sister a bit. Hold breath and go deep for me. Oh, let there be treasure. Let there be all the things. Oh. You found a thing. Oh, dear brother. Well, I'm sister. So what trove did you find? Here, here's a warm thing to put about you. Now, tell me. Tell me. Horrible. What are you saying? Gold's work. What trove is a horror, brother? What did you see? There at the bottom, a bit of float a foot from it. What was? A body. <gasps> of a man. Full grown and floating a foot from the bottom of the pond. Tied as he was and impaled as he was. Oh, sister, sister, foul and work her ghouls. Treasure trove indeed. What do you mean? Treasure trove indeed. Him with his cousin going to do good in the Americas. Treasure trove, indeed. And Mary and her brother went to the constable. And the constable caused the bottom of the pool to be searched. It took the authorities two days to extricate the body from where it had been staked. The watchers to the operation were many, including two lads who looked down on the scene from the east turret of Nem's castle. Two gamesters, croquet players, friends. If we fled, John, that we cannot. The crowd that surrounds the castle, they would tear it to shreds. Then what should we do? I don't know. I do. Good. Dear friend. Give ourselves up. What? The gaming thing. The right thing. Thing. True. The game is lost, therefore... True. He beat us. True. My cousin Roger, though dead, has won the game. to the police at almost the precise moment when Roger was brought up. They explained what happened. They were brought to trial, found guilty, pressed to death by rocks of increasing weight. Their refusal to protest in the face of adversity brought applause and favorable comment from all.
In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. Roger Nems, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music by the early 18th century composer Charles Avison was arranged and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Ben Wright was heard as John, Alastair Duncan as Roger, and Richard Peel as Guy. Featured in the cast were Betty Harford, Ellen Morgan, and Gary Montgomery. Bob Lamont speaking. Here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Dover, New Hampshire, in the year 1842. We will concern ourselves with a carnival, an alcoholic, and a wild beast. It's listed in my files as New Hampshire, the Tiger and Brad Ferguson. What happened then? Thank you. Good night. has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.